Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Jeff Sachs, director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University, and extremely honored and delighted to be welcoming Prime Minister Laurent Lamotte of Haiti. Uh, and uh, Prime Minister, you know how many friends you have in this community, uh, how many friends uh, at Columbia University and in the broader community. And I'm glad that uh, people are out in force. Uh, this was a, a hot ticket uh, to uh, have a chance to see you. We're very honored uh, by the Prime Minister's visit, uh, and we've uh, just had a, a wonderful meeting uh, beforehand with some of the scientists at the Earth Institute to discuss uh, ways that information technology and new strategies in uh, fields as uh, varied as infrastructure, public health, uh, education, agronomy uh, can be uh, effectively deployed. Uh, and uh, for that, uh, I think we're all very, very excited. What struck me in, in the meeting, Prime Minister, uh, was how much uh, love and affection there is for your country uh, in, in uh, our team and broadly. Uh, we spend a tremendous amount of time thinking about, uh, 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 worrying about, uh, and uh, helping uh, Haiti uh, and uh, trying to be with you uh, in, in the many challenges. Well, we know that Prime Minister Lamotte is a very dynamic leader of Haiti, uh, and he has been uh, throughout his life the youngest at, at everything, uh, it seems. Uh, uh, youngest uh, in uh, educational attainment, a tennis star, I understand, if I have that information uh, correct, Davis Cup uh, competitor, uh, and uh, youngest prime minister, and uh, a very, uh, very, very dynamic individual. I do think it's true as I go on in life, I find the prime ministers do get younger and younger uh, over time, uh, and uh, that is good. Uh, lots of energy lots of new direction, uh, lots of uh, idealism, and uh, lots of uh, capacity. Prime Minister Lamont has a very successful career in business in Haiti, uh, and he's an entrepreneur, and he brings an entrepreneurial talent to this mission. And as we know, that's what Haiti needs now. Uh, it needs the entrepreneurship of new directions, of taking on the challenges uh, of building a new Haiti, and we're eager uh, to hear your ideas about that, and you know, Prime Minister, that we are absolutely uh, eager to help you in any way and to partner along the way. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in welcoming Prime Minister Laurent Lamotte, who will speak today on balancing foreign direct investment, disaster risks, and development in Haiti. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sachs. And thank you to all students and members of the Haitian Consulate, ambassadors, member of the Haitian press, member of JPHRO that are here, thank you very much for coming. I'm delighted to be here with you this afternoon as a speaker at this university's prestigious World Leaders Forum. I'm truly humbled to be following the vast range of distinguished leaders from around the world that have spoken here on this very podium. I'm also very pleased that the Earth Institute, directed by Professor Sachs and Stephen Cohen, is a co-sponsor of this afternoon's event. Our government has been very impressed with your initiative in Haiti and the pilot program you've launched in Port Apima. We're particularly impressed and interested with the results of the baseline assessments of the reverberance in our southern peninsula and how these will help us develop an integrated watershed management program. 
as the first leader of Haiti to share this stage and with such impressive audience of scholars, students, business people, journalists, and others, I feel especially honored. This afternoon, I'll address an issue of significant concern to my country and the international community. How to balance foreign direct investment, disaster risk, and the challenges of development. I might be the first Haitian leader to address this forum. Many great Haitians have been here before. Recently, in 2010, Michelle Montas, an award-winning journalist who has dedicated her life to securing democratic values and freedom of our country, received the Dean's Medal for Public Service from Columbia University. Jacques Romain, arguably Haiti's greatest poet, novelist, journalist, and ethnologist, also attended this great university in the 1940s. Wume raised vivid questions in the 1930s and 40s that were and still are very much relevant about some of the issues facing our country today. I'm inspired by Montas and by Wume's ideals for a better, more just, and democratic Haiti. I must also say that I'm very happy about the turnout this afternoon because it demonstrates to me the interest that you all have for the development of my country and the deep concern that you share for Haiti. Your presence here this afternoon tells us that you are with us and we appreciate that. Thank you for coming. This afternoon, I am facing an audience of experts on a range of issues who have not only produced extraordinary scholarships, but have also been a part of the policy discussions around these topics. In preparation for this afternoon's talk, I again consulted for, for, for Jeffrey Sachs, who's thinking about how to move nations out of situation of profound economic crisis and poverty, and how this has influenced so many of us. I want to begin my remarks by focusing on the development debate as it has affected Haiti. Most of you are familiar with the long litany of generally negative descriptors that appear in major academic works and that prevail in journalistic accounts about Haiti. I will not repeat them this afternoon, but it is true that negative descriptions are recurrent and more so since the earthquake. Let me share with you that over the course of the past three years, we have begun to gradually prepare the way to revert these negative traits, to do our best to revert the negative comments. In my brief remarks this afternoon, I would like to examine where we came from, where we currently stand, and where we intend to reach within the next few decades. Because the goal is to make Haiti an emerging nation in 2030. Haiti's pattern of development has been deeply influenced by three characteristics. One, our original development model was not significantly different than the rest of the Western Hemisphere. Export-led growth tied generally to the agricultural sector and with the weak or non-existent development of high-value added exports. A, unlike the rest of the region, Haiti has never experienced an, an import substitution strategy. So our private sector has remained small and traditional, and traditional generating few jobs and relatively insignificant levels of investment. The state did not generate sufficient revenues to fund any public policy initiatives, 
not to mention basic social programs. The state was and continues to be the largest employer, especially of middle sectors who are dependent on the largest of the state to survive. The state currently hires 65,000 public sector employees and many thousand others of small jobs. This development model contributed to the centralization of nearly everything in the capital city, Port-au-Prince, which in turn accelerated rural-urban migration, resulting in an overcrowded capital city. The city of Port-au-Prince was built for 300,000 inhabitants. It currently has 3 million. In this context, the state and the private sector have been incapable of generating employment for the vast majority of, uh, of urban dwellers. Haiti presents an extreme version of a general regional pattern that includes the expansion of shanty towns, where basic services are scarce or non-existent, and where the vast majority of the economically active population survives in the informal economy. The consequences of this development model rendered Haiti vulnerable to natural catastrophes that, that have only prolonged the state of affairs in our country. A second dimension of Haiti's development pattern is linked to a recurrent pattern of foreign assistance. International aid has long been an important source of income for Haiti, but the pattern of dependence deepened since our country's transition to democracy in the 1980s. This is in fact the point that Professor Sachs has long argued. So I'm not saying anything new or unfamiliar to any of you today. In the past 20 years, foreign assistance has become a, largest, a large proportion of our state revenue. Foreign assistance aimed largely at helping us overcome natural events and political instability inadvertently also contributed to weakening our state capacity as most of this assistance bypassed specific government and relied mainly on NGOs. Thus, the state remained, the state revenue remained poor and experience an erosion of basic functions. It is also important not to misunderstand my position. Haiti is extremely grateful to the international community for assisting us, especially in the great times of need. My point is simply that the pattern of assistance has also contributed to the weakening of our state. A third characteristic has been our profound vulnerability to natural events such as hurricanes, floods, droughts, and most recently, the devastating earthquake in, in 2010. We sit in the middle of the Caribbean and we are located in close or into every single hurricane that passes to the region. We are somewhat affected, whether the eye goes over Haiti or not. Thus, to govern Haiti, it is important to realize that each year we must be alert to the possibility of a natural disaster. It means that we need strong institutions and, strong, and a strong inter institutional framework. Given the profound weakness of the state, the capacity to respond to these events on our own is very limited. Thus, foreign assistance is a reality that we have to deal with in the aftermath of every one of these events. Broadly defined, this was a state of affairs that our government encountered when we assumed office in May of 2011. As this continue to be profound structural changes that our government faces, for this very reason, we see our basic challenge today as establishing a very, very careful balance 
between overcoming the legacies of the pattern of development, mitigating the impact of natural events, and making Haiti a place that welcomes foreign direct investments. Overcoming these structural realities is not something that can be accomplished overnight. It requires a rigorously applied long-term development strategy. Over the course of our 23 months in office, we have been guided by the parameters of our master plan, which is called the Strategic Plan for the Development of Haiti, that has established firm goals for our country for the year 2030. Under the terms of this strategic plan, we are focusing on four major pillars of action that include territorial rebuilding, economic rebuilding, social rebuilding, and institutional rebuilding. Each of those areas has developed specific programs aimed at addressing specific development challenges. As for the territorial rebuilding, it calls for programs and projects linked with regional and urban planning, community development, environmental protection, watershed rehabilitation, urban renewal, national transportation systems, nationwide electricity distribution, expansion of telecommunication systems, and the creation of a national digital network. We also aim to improve the drinking water supply and sanitation capacities, including solid waste management. In the area of economic rebuilding, we are focusing on the implementation of coherent macroeconomic policy, support to private sector investment, modernization and revitalization of our agriculture, livestock and fishery production, upgrading the competitive sectors of the Haitian economy, such as manufacturing and tourism, developing a construction industry, developing the service sector, ensuring the sustainable exploitation of geolo geologic resources, and implementing employment generating projects. Social rebuilding is perhaps our most serious challenge to date. It includes the development of a network of healthcare and educational facilities throughout Haiti, including higher education and professional and vocational training. We are also pursuing programs aimed at heritage protection and arts support measures, better access to housing, the development of civic action, sports, recreation opportunities for all. In the institutional rebuilding, it includes revising the legal framework, reinforcing the administrative structures of the legislative and judicial branches, modernizing the civil service, including the police, public security, and others, increasing the number of regional civil service employees, and reinforcing local government and administrations and, administrations and civil society. This is the framework that underlines our policy efforts and that helps us through this precarious balance between our development legacies, our vulnerability to, natu to natural events, and our recurrent need for the right type of foreign assistance, namely foreign direct investment. What have we done so far? I would like to share with you some of the efforts that we've conducted under the theme of the long-term strategic development plan. We are convinced that what we are doing today in Haiti is setting the stage for the kind of country that all of us here in this room want Haiti to be by the year 2030. Direct foreign investment is the strategic platform for significant improving, for significantly improving Haiti's business environment and creating the long-term jobs our people so desperately need. 
the success of our efforts to attract foreign direct investments, meaning that Haiti is really open for business, can be seen in the successful projects now underway. Those include a 617-acre, $257 million industrial park in Caracol, recently completed. This project underwritten with funds from the IDA, the U.S. government, and, and others is an, an, is an excellent example of what can be achieved through partnerships between the public sector and, in, and institu international institutions. Caracol is aligned with our strategic plans for decentralization. At the same time, it's creating jobs. Over 1,500 jobs have been created so far. Our, our government has committed to creating up to 20,000 jobs in the northern area. And the anchor tenant, SEA, has committed to creating several thousand of those jobs. And SEA is a major South Korean textile manufacturer that's operating in Caracol. The second industrial park is expected to create over 500 jobs in northern Port-au-Prince and is a $58 million project with over 3,000 social housing, clinics, sports centers, water treatment plant, and a place where the, some of the victims of the earthquake will be able to find a decent place to live. One of the key growth areas is our tourism development. You know, I'm very happy and excited to see so much happening in the tourism sector in such a short time. Over the past 12 months, the government has approved 11 new hotel projects, totaling over $160 million. By adding the rooms needed, these projects give us the receptive areas to be a top tourist destination. As importantly, these ho new hotels will create 1,600 new jobs and 6,500 indirect jobs. In the most recent report from the STR global release, Haiti is rates as the fastest growing room supply destination with plus 58 0.2% growth in terms of rooms availability in the country. We, are, we have seen in the past three months the opening of two new hotels, a five-star hotel, first hotel owned by an international chain, Occidentales, also a Best Western Premier, which is the first American chain in Haiti, and according to the uh, CEO, the nicest, best Western, certainly in the air, in the hemisphere. So we're very happy about that. We have several hotels opening and the country is taking off. You feel that the development of Haiti is finally happening. The nation building that we've all been waiting for is starting to happen. We're paving 735 kilometers of roads to give better access and better communication to cities. We're building five new airports. We are investing in, in sports infrastructure. 15 new stadiums have been built. 50 small stadiums are being built. When this government arrived, we had over 1.5 million, half of the population was homeless, was living in tents from the first day of, of the administration mandate till today, we're working nonstop to move these people that are our brothers and sisters from living in subhumane conditions under tents into their original neighborhoods with a year worth of rental subsidy. And so far, we've been able to move 80% of the tent population. Since Columbia University is one of the largest universities 
and the most respected in the world, it's appropriate for me to note our commitment to fundamentally transform Haiti's educational system so that our country is able to rely on a workforce that make Haiti a competitive one. We have begun at the very bottom of the system addressing the basic problems of access to education. When we took office, nearly half a million children had no access to education. Taking into account that the law in Haiti mandates free schooling, we have designed a specific program to facilitate access to free basic education to over 1.2 million children that previously had to pay for that, that schooling in a system where 80% of the school system is private. It is a responsibility for the government of Haiti to provide that, and we are doing our very best to do so. We are putting together a database, an online database, to facilitate the management and monitoring of the program. Have recruited 4,853 new teachers to teach in more than 10,000 schools that are part of the program. We are building 200 new schools. And in order to continue funding, we have we're doing significant financial reforms in the education sector. We have put in surcharges to finance existing needs of tuition for those, the poorest children, and we're putting together reforms that, are, that have been voted at the lower chamber of parliament for a national education fund that will give Haiti the first of its kind fund to be able to finance the expansion of the education system. One of the stark realities that we're facing in Haiti is the vulnerability of people living in extreme poverty. Our goal is to lift as many people as possible out of poverty and to set a social safety net that will guarantee acceptable living standards for most Haitians. We have put together the first of its kind national assistance social program. It ranges from cash transfers to the elderly and the disabled, to hot meals and subsidies for university students and farmers. This is the largest and most structured social assistance program ever to be implemented in the country. Already millions of dollars have been directed to the program, with a million people benefiting to date. Our goal is to assist over five million people by the end of 2012. Under this program, regular cash transfers to a first group of 25,000 handicapped and 25,000 elderly Haitians in need. We are also assisting 100,000 destitute mothers, li those living in extreme poverty. Already 57,000 have, re have received their benefits. Over 22,000 university students are, are receiving subsidies, and 60,000 farming kids have been given out to farmers to work their land. This is the first time in its history that Haiti has attempted such a vast and orderly social initiative. We have allocated 0.4% of our GDP per capita to this program. With $15 million already spent, the government is looking at expanding this program because we have the commitment, we are committed to the goal of lifting as many Haitians as possible because we feel that living in extreme poverty is, in 2013 is simply unacceptable. And we will do the best we can to help our brothers and sisters living in that inhumane situation. To conclude, allow me to thank each and every one of you and to tell you a little bit about a recent surprise visit that I had in one of Port-au-Prince's poorest neighborhoods. I went at 11.30 at night and a young mother 
told me that she never learned how to read nor write. And neither did her mom, neither did her grandparents. And her kids were going to face the same faith. With tears in her eyes, she told me that thanks to the free schooling program, her child, her four children, will be better than she ever was because the children are learning the basic reading and writing. Statements like this and gestures like this are a very small step into understanding the depth of helping millions of people that have never been helped before. People that had never received any assistance from any governments before. People that had to fight to drink a glass of water. Glass of potable water. This is our commitment. And these are the real stories of the Haiti that we are attempting to build. One that cares. One that is solidar that has solidarity towards the weakest. One that wants to fight to get rid of corruption. One that wants to do better. One that wants to have a better image, that wants to be seen around the world as making the best possible effort to get out of the cycle of poverty. And one that every Haitian can be proud of. Thank you very much, Professor Sachs, for having me. Thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, my name is Glenn Denning, uh, Director of the Center on Globalization and Sustainable Development at the Earth Institute. And uh, His Excellency the Prime Minister has kindly agreed to take some questions from the audience. Uh, he'd especially like to hear from some of the students here today, but everybody is, is, is welcome. I, I would ask you to please keep your questions uh, very brief. Uh, to the point. Uh, we would not like to hear speeches, but uh, we'd like to hear from you and hear from as many of you as possible. Uh, would you please begin uh, with your name and your affiliation? So I think we possibly have our first speaker. Yeah? Yes, could you come to the microphone, please? Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Drukin Fitnard. I'm Haitian and also I'm a proud alum of uh, Columbia University. It's great to be back and it's great to see you, Prime Minister. So um, my question is, um, uh, I am currently also doing projects in Haiti and I can attest to what you just said in terms of the changes that are, that are happening on the ground. But um, the question I'd like to ask you particularly is, what plan, what are the plans in place to guarantee or to make sure that those social um, programs that you mentioned are, remain after the terms of the presidency? So what are the framework to guarantee that those programs will be there like, you know, after you leave office? That's a very good question, one that I get asked very often. Uh, the people want to see that these are sustainable programs because they help so many, so many people. So one of the, right now, we have started because we needed to start because of the extreme emergency. And we are reviewing a set of strategies to introduce uh, a fund and introduce new taxes in order to carry this forward uh, permanently, to have a permanent uh, tax system in order to fund some of these uh, programs and reallocate some other taxes that are going to programs into these programs that 
actually work because some of the other social programs, you know, they touch very few people. For example, the Caisse Assistance Social is touching less than 10,000 people. We want to touch as many people as possible. We're already, we already reaching about a million, and we feel that with the introduction of some permanent um, um, fiscal additions, we'll be able to, to maintain some of those programs for the long run. Please uh, line up at the microphone. Uh, Prime Minister, <laughs> thank you for, for being here. My name is Jacob Kushner. I'm in the journalism program here. And I have a question about uh, a major source of foreign direct investment for many developing countries is mining. And obviously there are a number of North American mining companies, very large ones, including Newmont and Eurasian, um, exploring for minerals right now in Haiti. And I understand that the um, head of the, the longtime head of the Bureau of, the, of, of Mining and Energy um, was kind of forced out recently in favor of somebody else. And I guess my question is, um, what is Haiti's government, what legislation is, is currently in, under consideration, being it uh, legislation or conventions, um, to ensure that an eventual mine that's opened in Haiti benefits the government and the rural population in those areas as best as possible? Thank you very much for your question. And we're doing two things. One, we are reviewing the, the mining law to make sure that they not only protect the Haitian, uh, not only that it protects Haiti itself, but that it also protects the environment of the local population. That's one. Two, we're doing an assessment of the natural resources that we have to determine their worth. Because one of the initial points that we must do before we start even you know, engaging is, is to know what is the worth of what we have with the evaluation. Once we have those two, we'll be better equipped with certainly assistance from uh, experts to negotiate the best possible agreements uh, along with the Parliament of Haiti, you know, to have the best possible agreement where, Haitian, where Haiti will benefit. As you say, we don't have that many resources, so the few ones that we have, we want to make sure that they are utilized, uh, that they are maximized to the fullest. Um, hi, my name is Vinny Saraswati, and I'm a graduate student here at Columbia University. Um, and my question is relating to your comments on the need for Haiti to prepare for future natural disasters. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how Haiti is integrating um, climate change into those preparedness efforts. Uh, what we're doing right now uh, is, is many things. First, we are organizing ourselves with a permanent risk uh, disaster management office because up till now they were it has it hadn't been clearly defined so we're investing in that second we're working on 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 system of alerts to alert the population uh, in case of for example an earthquake or in, in better communication systems three in terms of prevention we are working to equip for example we build 10 hurricane shelters which never existed before. So the problem is every time you had a flooding, every time you had a natural disaster, well, the people, the most vulnerable people, went into shelters that happened to be schools. So when the, the disaster would last a long time, the, the people don't want to leave the school. So now you have a problem with the disaster, with people moved out of where they're supposed to be, and they go into schools, so blocking several schools from the school system. So we've built um, some hurricane disaster uh, shelters. We also, for the children in the, you know, for the orphans, because there is many from the earthquake and they're very vulnerable because they're on the street, we build also nine transit centers, you know, where we could move, where we're moving them to, that they have a place to go. And general, the policy, um, we're structuring the, 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 the risk management uh, system in a way where all government ministries are touched are, 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 and are sensitized towards the problem of preparedness, something that hadn't been done in the past. We would prepare just a few days before, and now the whole government machinery is being oiled and is, and, and is being geared towards uh, you know, disaster prevention and risk management. So on top of all that, we are working to, to reinforce some of the insurance system that we have. Because after every natural disaster, there is great losses, and the insurance usually they don't cover for that type of uh, hurricane damage and natural 
and natural disasters. So we are working in order to get to that point so that it doesn't decapitalize uh, people every time there is a, a problem. So we are touching several different sectors until we get it right. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you very much for speaking with us today. Uh, my name is Gerald McElroy. I work with an education NGO in the Dominican Republic that works with Haitians, and I'm also a student in the Masters of Development Practice program with Professor Denning and Professor Wa. Um, my question for you today is, um, you, talk, you stress the importance of international involvement in development in Haiti in, in future years. <clears throat> this isn't a country that has uh, historically um, had the involvement of short-sighted foreigners um, and NGOs and other organizations. What, is your, what steps is your administration taking to ensure that the involvement of the international community is, is productively contributing to Haiti's development? And also, what role do you see the diaspora playing in the coming years? Um, you have a very vibrant uh, Haitian diaspora in Canada, the United States, Europe. Um, how do you envision their involvement? One, for the NGO, uh, there is two things. One, we are restructuring the oversight and monitoring of the NGOs to know where they are, what they're doing, and whether what they're doing falls within the Haiti's master plan, which is the strategic development plan of Haiti. So long as it does also, what we ask of the NGOs is that they don't, I mean, right now they some, somewhat compete with the Haitian government for funding that normally would go to nation building. And nation building is the work of the government with, uh, with experts. What we envision the role of the NGOs to be is to be there to support us, to complement us, not to compete with the government. That's very important distinction. So in order not to compete, we're putting together this plan that, that, will, be, that will define clearly the work scope of the NGOs you know, on websites and to see exactly what NGOs are doing in what areas. We don't want the NGOs to go completely, but we don't want them to compete uh, with the government in, in terms of nation building and reconstruction. Uh, the, the, the diaspora has a prominent role to play because if you want to rebuild a society, if you want to rebuild a country, 85% of our, we have a brain drain factor. You know, 85% of, 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 of Haiti's brains has, has left to come to the United States or, or France or Canada or others. So in order to rebuild the country, the type of rebuilding that we want to, to see happen, we definitely need every brain that's in the diaspora to, to, to be able to go back. Now, we have different issues. A lot of the brains, they're working here on very high salaries. So they, they, they won't necessarily want to go back for, a le for, I mean, for a lower pay. So in order to compensate that, we're working on a program that will compensate the pay that they're losing in order for them to benefit. And there is several of them already you know, going back. But the challenge is to get everybody that wants to get back at equal pay and equal benefits. So that's a challenge because, you know, we're asking them to sacrifice to come back to the country and to help, but then we, have to, we also have to provide some basic necessities for them to come back. And sometimes it's very challenging because as we have our own challenges in Haiti, in the public administration sector, to give you a simple example, uh, a minister in the government earns $2,000, $24,000 a year. So if I tell, for example, a professor at Columbia that's Haitian American to come in, or a doctor that's here to come and move back to Haiti, we need to find a way to compensate some of the salaries. Because I doubt that they will come for the 24K a year. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister, thank you very much for being here. My name is Natasha Castelli, and I am Haitian. Good. <laughs> Fortunately, you've actually touched on the question that I had, because what I really wanted to know is, um, for those of us who are part of the diaspora and who are willing, ready, and capable of participating in the change that your government is currently making, what, what is next? Well, one thing that the president says, um, and, and it's, you know, Haiti, is a free, is a free, is an entrepreneurial type of, of society. People can open whatever business that you want to succeed. So a lot of it, I mean, I mean, we need to find a way to compensate for some of the risk, but then we need risk takers as well. Because at the end of the day, 
Anybody can open a business in Haiti, and anybody can open schools, anybody can open a car dealership, anybody can open a restaurant, anybody can open whatever that they, they would want. Now, the, per, the, 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 the Haitian Americans living here have an added advantage that they have some capital, whereas the Haitian doesn't have access to capital. So it, you will be in a much better position to open a business, you know, to go to Haiti, work on the economic recovery, but then there, there needs to be some type of risk taking that has to happen on both ends. The government alone won't be able to accommodate for four million people living in, 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 in the diaspora. We can do a program where we accommodate some, but then what we need to do and what we've been doing is creating the basic security uh, situation. Right now, the security has greatly improved in Haiti and continues to improve. Actually, in, in terms of statistics, according to the UNODC office, Haiti is as safe as Long Beach, California, because we have eight crimes for every 100,000 uh, people, same as Long Beach. So Long Beach has better marketing than we do, <laughs> and we're working on that. But the, the idea is that statistics never lie. Numbers, ne numbers don't lie. Now, the idea for the Haitian Americans is to take the risk as well. You need to take some, some risk. And the reward is greater, because you have, up to now, very little competition. The market is, uh, is, is open. So if you have a good idea, you know, if you want to open a restaurant, instead of going to open it in, uh, in, uh, you know, in New York, come, in, da come on down to open it in Haiti. You have, you'll, you'll have a better market, and you'll have less competition. So those are ideas that it doesn't have to, and I don't want everybody to think that the government itself, the government has very little reach in terms of opening up businesses. What we can do, which we've done, is to make it easier for you to open a business. And today you can go online on CFI website, CFI is the investment office, and you can open a company, of the, buy a company off the shelf for half the price you would, it would cost to open a company in Haiti. So this is what we can do. But it, then again, like I've been saying, like John F. Kennedy said, don't ask what your country can do for you. Ask for what you can do for your country. Because that's what we need. The 85% of the, of the Haitians living abroad, we need you to ask right now, what can you do for Haiti? And come and help us. Thank you. My name is Fritz Herrick. I'm, affi I'm affiliated with uh, the Melman School of Public Health uptown. Uh, my question is about the recent uh, outbreak of cholera in your country. What is the uh, government plan to uh, address this outbreak? And is the government prepared to lead even in the event that the nation states of the United Nations do not fully fund the recovery efforts? Thank you. We've gone a long way to solve that, the cholera issue. The Ministry of Health has put, put out the national uh, health plan to deal with cholera, along with assistance with the CDC to have a vaccine. And right now, the cholera cases have gone way down. I mean, I, we're talking about less than three cases uh, per day, up from you know, over f five, 6,000. So right now, it's, closely, it's close to disappearing. And we have two studies, one from the CDC that, 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 uh, that um, preaches, I mean, that specifies the use of vaccines. And then we have another study by a French professor that states we, that with very little funds and in the dry season, we can you know, get rid of the disease completely. But Haiti is, is not, the, the cholera right now is, is, on, is disappearing. Good afternoon, Mr. Prime Minister. My name is Walter Jean-Jacques. I'm also Haitian myself. I'm the co-president of the Haitian Student Association, and I'm also the nephew of Senator Andrus Richet, the vice president of the Haitian Senate. And my question pertains to the Kita Nago movement. Um, I want to ask your opinion of how does that influence the particular unification of Haiti currently? Well, before I answer the question, since I'm at Columbia, I'm going to ask if anybody knows what Kita Nago is. <laughs> if not, that's a Google, send you to Google uh, search. 
it's a movement that that, that initiated in in uh, the department where um, Senator Richie is in the Gardens in Les Iwa, and it's a solidarity movement where they have a trunk of tree that they cut, and the trunk of tree is traveled all across Haiti in all the different cities and is, is pushed by different groups of people from town to town to town to town until it reached the end point, which is on the other side of Haiti. So it travels several hundred kilometers and, and uh, as a solidarity movement. So the people, they really don't sleep there 24 hours a day, you know, carrying the, I mean, handing, I mean, handing off the trunk of tree until it gets to the destination. So it was, it was a way for the organizers to show unity and solidarity amongst Haitians. Because Haiti historically has been a very divided country, has been a country, because you have a lot of inequalities uh, in the country, the, the, the society has been bitterly divided. And that movement was a movement to show that with strength, unity, and solidarity, we can do great things. So I gave you the best possible explanation that I could and I invite you to Google uh, the rest for additional information. But it was a very s important and significant movement for Haiti. We have our last two questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Gregory Paul. I'm a senior at Columbia College, uh, majoring in economics. And being Haitian American, it's, it's, um, it's very welcoming being here. Um, so this is a two-part question. I just want to know what specific steps are you taking to kind of spread all this wealth of information down to um, the people living in Port-au-Prince and the people living uh, around the city. Um, I think one thing I appreciate about Haiti is the model at La Union Fela Force is people coming together and working together. So what steps is the administration taking to kind of have this, all this wealth of information trickle down to the common folk? Also, um, this is not too much related, but uh, what's stronger, your forehand or your backhand? <laughs> Back in. <laughs> um, you know, I see a bunch of Haitian Americans graduating from Colombia, so maybe that's a good opportunity to have an exchange program with Haiti, because all of you that graduate, you know, we need you and your expertise and what you learn here. And I said the same thing at Harvard, where I had the speech, and MIT, where we, had, we signed an exchange program with MIT to assist with some of the human resources challenges that we have. So. Since so many Haitian Americans are here, this is a good opportunity for you to, uh, to help your country. We are, the people in the, in the, the people in the, in the townships, they know the work that we're doing because most of the work we do is there. Um, in Cité Soleil, which is like the largest uh, township in the country, you know, we put for the first time ever uh, solar, solar lamps all over, all over the town. We invested, I mean, there is over, over 20,000 people that benefited from some of the social assistance program. We have over 44 schools in, those in, in that particular neighborhood that, that, is, uh, that offers free schooling, the free sp schooling program. We have, we have water sanitation projects. We're doing two new stadiums. So a lot of the projects that, that we're doing, they are being done inside the poorest area. So they, they, they're aware of that. And we have, uh, of course, the radio and community, uh, and, and we have uh, a group that talks to the different communities to explain to them what we're doing. So a lot of work is being put into also reaching out to the community and telling them what we're doing um, for them. But they feel it also. Hello, thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, for being here. My name is Casey Hamilton, and I'm a freelance travel writer. I'm also Jamaican, and I wondered um, what are the long-term plans for developing tourism in Haiti, if you could expound on that. You mentioned the new hotels that opened, but I just wondered what the, the long-term goal was. Four, there is four points. One is the development of, of hotels in the, in the capital to have a good reception capacity, and that one we're well on our way. We have, we have a brand new five-star hotel that opened. We have the Royal we have the Best Western, and the existing hotels, they're expanding capacities. Uh, so, so, and then we have three major tourist areas that we are pushing. One is, uh, is the southern p peninsula, the southern coast, where we have certainly some of the nicest beaches uh, in Haiti. And then you, we have uh, Jacques Mel, which is a historic city. That's where um, Pétion helped Simon Bolivar before he went to liberate South America. 
So we're investing in tourist infrastructures there. $40 million are going into a new hotel, paving the roads, fixing the drainage system, waste management plants. And uh, we're doing a lot to also bring up the cultural heritage of this wonderful and historic city of Jacques Mel. And we're doing something out of the box, which is investing in, for the first time in an offshore island, which is, again, that's uh, your homework after I'm, I'm done here, which is the, uh, investing in Ilavash. Ilavash is by far, and when you do the research, you'll, you'll see what I'm saying, by far the nicest island in the Caribbean. It has, I mean, nothing against Jamaica, huh? But we are pushing that with a $40 million government investment. And also there is private investment that are going to come there. We're building a, an airport on Ilavash to have a, an independent tourist destination so that when you want to come here, you know, you, take, you fly Delta and you land straight on Ilavash and then you have a paradise, you know, around you with nice white sandy beaches, Sunday year round. And a warm people, best foods. So we want to give you that Haitian experience for you all to, uh, to see for yourself. So we, I mean, we are pushing significantly the investment there. And this will be a one of a kind uh, island for you all to enjoy. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, I, I take away a couple of, uh, of big messages from, from the talk this afternoon. And the first one is, uh, for our vacations, we have to go to Haiti and not Long Beach, or anywhere else for that matter. Um, our second, if you're a real entrepreneur, like the Prime Minister, you'll invest in Haiti and not in New York City. I think I, I got that right. Um, I can't speak on behalf of the university, but I do think that uh, we're very open to exploring the kind of exchange uh, discussions that you've had with uh, Harvard and MIT, and we'll see if we can, we can uh, match those with uh, the kind of enthusiasm that you saw from the, the students this afternoon. Uh, we're, we're really grateful for the time that you've spent with us at the World Leaders uh, Forum. Uh, we thank you for sharing the, the 2030 uh, vision, the current programs and the progress that it, you're very clearly making. Uh, we're also grateful for your very uh, candid uh, and insightful uh, responses to the various questions uh, from the audience. And I think on behalf of the whole group, we, we wish you a, a successful continuation of your mission in the United States. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, thank the, the Prime Minister uh, for coming here with us today.